Yeah, I just had him Leo work with on foundation, Ethereum Foundation on the Solidity team doing language design work and compiler work and also doing formal verification, which is what this talk is about. I'm going to talk about Solidity's SMT checker, which is a formal verification component that gives compile time results about um, safety, safety checks. So have two questions. So how many people here are Solidity developers? OK, cool. And how do you feel about audience participation? OK, cool. You asked how, so the, question, the answer is, you're going to help me solve this. Um, so I want to first introduce what is SMT, what's, why SMT checker. So the SMT comes from satisfiability module theories. Um, and an SMT solver is a tool that will take a formula like this, a first order logic formula, and try to, to answer this question. Can we find integer values for A, B, C such that um, this formula, when we substitute the, the values um, for these variables, evaluates to true? So just to, we can go together over the formula, um, just to give a little bit of context to whoever is not familiar with um, logical connectives and these kind of things. Um, OK, so it's a Boolean formula, right? It's a conjunction of constraints. So this formula kind of returns true or false, right? A Boolean value. These constraints are satisfiable together or not. So first we have this part of the formula, which basically says it's kind of like a function definition, right? So there's a lot of syntax abuse here, but we're going to ignore that for now. So this says that for whatever x, f of x equals x times 42, OK? Then next, we have two constraints over the input variables we chose. So we're saying that A has to be greater or equal B, and B has to be greater or equal C. And then last, we, are, we applied function f. We defined before over A and C, saying f of A has to be greater or equal f of C. So now the question. Again, can we find integer values that evaluate the formula to, to true? Yes. Um, OK. Can you give me values for ABC? Um, no. <laughs> but basically, um, the right part says um, F for A has to be larger than F for C. Yeah. So now you told me that it's possible, right? It's possible to give values for ABC such that the formula is true. Yeah, zero, zero, zero. Zero, zero, zero. Does that work? It works, right? Zero, greater or equal zero, true. Same thing for BC, f of A is zero, f of, e, f of C is zero. It's true, right? But well, unfortunately, that's not the one that I had here, so. Anyway, so this one works, right? Also, this one works, and this one works. Um, how many do you think, how many solutions, how many different sets of values for ABC do you think we can get for this formula? Infinite, right? Um, now, a slightly different question. What happens if we change this, if we change the comparison of f of a and f of c to this? And repeat the question. Is there a set of values for a, b, c that make the formula true? So there's a consensus saying no, and that's correct. And when that's the case, we say that the formula is unsatisfiable because there is no set of values that satisfy the formula. So in the previous case, it was satisfiable. Now we have unsatisfiable. And why did I choose this formula? I could have chosen many other formulas. So the reason um, is we can read this formula in many ways, right? It can be just a logical formula. But this formula happens to, we can, we can also read this formula as this part here highlighted right now being a property we want to prove about a function, right, application of the function. That part being local constraints, say, on, on input variables. And here, basically, a function definition. So this is basically how we just proved correctness of this smart contract. Um, here we have a function definition, which um, would be encoded in the SMT language as the first uh, term of the, of the conjunction. Here we have two local constraints, right, that evaluate, that are encoded, sorry, um, 
as those, those two constraints. And here we have the application of the function. But you will probably notice, notice right now that in the code, I have assert f of a greater or equal f of c, because it's a property I want to prove, right? Um, and here, in the logical formula that we give to the SMT solver, it's actually last than, so it's the opposite operation, right? The reason why we actually ask for the opposite is if this is unsatisfiable, if we try to prove the negation of the property and the solver says it's unsatisfiable, this means that there's no behavior, there's no values for local variables with that encoding that actually break the assertion, right? So in this case, the solver will tell me it's unsatisfiable, which means the assertion is safe. Again, because there's no way you can go through the program and break the assertion. So for all cases, you can ever come up with the assertion is true. But let's change a little bit. So is that assertion true? Is that assert correct for every input? It's not, right? So for our query to the SMT solver, um, we negate the property, right? So I want to find values. I want the SMT solver to give me values for my variables that actually break the assertion. So I want f of a to be different from f of c. And in this case, the solver will tell me it's satisfiable, and here are some values. And this is exactly the output that Solidity Compiler will give you at compile time when you, try, when you run exactly that code. So here we see that the compiler will say assertion violation happens here for this assertion for a1, b1, c1, c0, sorry. So the SMT checker, as a summary, after the example, as you saw, it's a SMT-based, so we use SMT servers, so it's an SMT-based smart contract form of verification framework. Um, it's built in the compiler, which is, uh, for us, one of the, one of the big advantages um, compared to other ways to formally verify your code. Um, the way it works, the way the approach, uh, our approach is that we encode program logic from Solidity into SMT statements and use SMT Solver to run those queries that I just mentioned. And we use those to check for assertion failures, overflow, underflow, um, trivial conditions, unreachable code, and all of that happens automatically when you run the compiler. Um, one characteristic of this approach, which is close to from the formal verification community called bounded model check-in, is that this approach is sound but not complete. And what that means is, if it's sound, which this approach is, whenever it says the assertion is safe, it is actually safe. But whenever it says the assertion is not safe, here's a counterexample, it might be, that might be not true. So you might have to verify it and see that this, this might have been caused by an abstraction of some unsupported features or functions, which is the case um, for our approach. But then being sound but not complete also gives advantage that it's pretty fast and light compared to other approaches. And it gives useful counterexamples because it's applied directly on Solidity code instead of EVM byte code, which then you would have to map back to Solidity program variables, which um, doesn't necessarily work. So here are some other um, frameworks that have been um, already uh, in, in the ecosystem for, for some time. Um, in the EVM formal semantics side, we have ETH, Isabel, and KVM, which are, uh, well, KVM especially is pretty established um, as a really good framework for, for, for form verification of, of smart contracts. It's more expressive, but it also means that it, it's harder and takes longer to give you proof. So these two approaches have pros and cons. Um, KLab is a really nice debugger for K, for K proofs, with, and they will have a workshop tomorrow, so make sure to check that out. Um, for EVM bytecode verification, there are tools like Oyente, Muthra, and Mayan which do symbolic execution of the bytecode and try to find bugs, basically. And there were other projects that were translating Solidity to language that were already verifi verifiable, like Y3, FSTAR, and Zeus did that with LLVM, if I'm not mistaken. So how do we use it? You just need one line of code. Um, it, right now, it's an experimental feature. It's a very experimental feature right now. So if you use it, you will find internal compiler errors. You will find unsupported features and all those kind of things. But we are working on it um, to make it 
of course, much more usable and hopefully non-experimental um, one day. But then the next question is, how do I actually use it? So if I just insert this line of code there, then sure, it's going to enable the run of the SMT checker. But what is it what is it actually doing? So you need to write formal specifications, right? So whenever you prove your program is safe, you only prove it with respect to a specification. Otherwise, you're not proving anything. So you need to specify what properties you're actually proving. In Solidity or with the SMT checker, you don't need anything extra. You use the normal require and asserts from the language itself. So requires and asserts in a compiler are, tra are translated into runtime checks, right? When it's compiled to VM bytecode. But here in the uh, SMT checker, we use them as, as the formal specification. So we use requires as, as assumptions and asserts as verification targets. So whatever conditions you write in a require, the SMT checker is going to assume it's true. And whatever you write inside an assert, it's going to try to prove. OK, so how to use a require, actually? So there is a lot of debate um, for quite a while already on requires and asserts and when to use each or what, it, what which one means. So I just copied it. I'm going to read it from Solidity Docs. The require function should be used to ensure valid conditions on inputs and contract state variables or to validate return values from calls to external contracts. So here in this example, we have a contract that has a state variable A, a bunch of functions G and H, which suppose like that we don't know right now what they do. And we have this function F that takes an integer X. So here we are using requires requires to filter values for A and X, right? So we want, for some reason, A to be 0 and X to be less than 100. Then we sum both, we put it in A. And then after that, we, we know that A less than 100 is true, right? Because of the requires before. So if you want to prove that, the last statement should actually have been a require, uh, sorry, an assert and not a require. Because a require, we're just going to assume it. And with, this, with the assert, we're actually using past knowledge to prove a new property about your code in the end of the function. So what about asserts? The assert function should only be used to test for internal errors and to check invariants. Properly functioning code should never reach a failing assert statement. And this is really important. If this happens, there is a bug in our contract, which you should fix. Same example now, just using asserts everywhere. Um, can we assert a equals 0 over there? Very likely not, right? Of course, it depends on what, what G and H are doing. But if we don't really know what it's doing, we cannot say assert A equals A, because A can be whatever, right? And especially for X here, if you say assert X less than 100, it's a public function. So anyone can call this function with X equals to 100, and your assertion is already wrong, right? So this is really important to notice. Like, you should only assert things that you're really sure are true at that moment for every single execution path that reaches that point. Um, and here, um, the assertion is correctly placed at the end because it's a new property you're proving. Yeah? Uh, does, does the checker use uh, modular verification? So does it, A is a, is a state variable. Will it assume that any value could be in there? Yeah, at this moment, yeah. So, for example, when you have, I'm going to talk about this later, but if you call an external function, for example, which you don't have control over or don't know the code, then when the function comes back, we have to reset all knowledge about state variables, right? Because you might have this contract you called, might have called your contract back, which changed A, so you can't really keep the knowledge about it. But, yeah, but modular verification, one of the research goals that we have is to actually infer properties from different functions and see what state invariants we can come up with automatically. This is not done yet, but it's on the to-do list. Um, what about false positives? So I mentioned earlier that the approach is sound. So if it says it's safe, it's safe. But it gives, counter, it gives false positives, which is basically false counterexamples. So you, your assertion might be correct and safe, but the tool says it's not safe. Why does that happen? It happens because we have to abstract the encoding sometimes. So for example, for complex types and functions, say like cryptographical functions, we 
it's not a, our approach is not expressive enough to actually implement it. So we have to use symbolic variables on um, on the application of the function, and that's as far as it gets. So we don't really know what the actual value of the function call is going to be. So these abstractions might lead to false positives. Also, if you call external function, if you do if you yeah ex call f external functions, we might have you. We do clear the knowledge after the call, after, after the function call. So it might not have been the case that the that state variable A got rewritten, but you never know. So to be safe, again, we have to clear the knowledge. Also, with contract state invariance, you as a developer of the contract might know that certain properties are valid throughout your contract, but the SMT checker is not yet smart enough to um, deduce those properties automatically. So, yeah. Um, and one point that I wanted to mention in this talk is you can actually help the SMT checker. You can help the tool to actually find the proofs. And it's a very simple way to do it. You can um, flood your code with requires. So every assumption, even very simple things that you know are true at that point, um, even if it's if, even if it might sound redundant to you, it might help the solver because the more constraints you give, the less false positives um, the tool is gonna is gonna issue. So I'm gonna run a couple examples right now. Um, I think I have like eight minutes. Can everyone read? Uh, not in general, but the uh, screen. What? I did push. Um, yeah, I want to start with this one. Like, OK, so this is like a very tiny token and not very interesting. So um, we have a map in with balance. Constructor initializes the balance of the message sender with a bunch of tokens. And accounts can transfer tokens to each other, right? So there are a few, line, a few extra lines in this piece of code, right, compared to normal token implementations. Um, so first of all, here, this is a normal one, right? We require that the message sender actually has um, the amount in their balance. But here I'm actually storing the old values um, for the balances for the person sending the transaction and the person receiving. And yeah, the person received the account receiving the amount. Here, the, the balances are updated, right? And here, you have an assertion that says that the sum of the balances before the transaction, before the operations, have to be equal to the sum of the balances after the operation. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this should be the right um, assertion, but I wanted to break. So. Oh, okay. So here, the tool tell the compiler tells us the assertion is broken and gives a bunch of values for, for our, our variables, right? So, but there's something weird, right? So it's saying that it gave zero to both to and message sender, which commonly people prevent, right? So we can just add that here. Um, I want message sender to be, oh, this is actually not gonna work. So I'm just gonna say they have to be different. It's fine if there's zero. So, okay, now it changed, right? So two went to one, before it was zero. Message sender is still zero, but that's fine because they're different. And the assertion is actually saying that the balance before was greater than the balance right now, which means that some tokens vanished, right? So the assertion is basically saying every time there's a transfer, tokens vanish, which hopefully is wrong. And the tool says it's wrong. You can see balance from plus balance to um, is actually the same as balance of zero plus balance of one, which are the accounts. So if we actually fix the assertion, there you go. If there's no, if it doesn't complain, it means it's safe. Um, I'm going to move on to a slightly better example with a bunch of false positives. Oh, not this. This. Okay, so here we have um, yeah this contract C. This this external contract 
It doesn't matter for now. Let me remove it. Oh, sorry about that. It's not the one I want to show. This one. So we have just like kind of an account that has a sum. It, it stores um, the sum, um, the balance of, of like it, it's its own um, balance. And here it counts how many transactions, um, how many times the fallback function was called, increasing the value, increasing the balance of this account. So here we have the fallback function that says um, that the, the value sent has to be greater than zero. And this is just to uh, give a constraint and avoid, and avoid overflows later, um, requiring that this account cannot have more than one million. The balance cannot be greater than one million. So here we just increase the sum and increase the count, right? And here we have a function called average that computes the average, um, the average value that was sent per transaction. All right? So here I put this require because if, if there was no transaction, it doesn't make sense to compute the average. But here we have an, so here we compute the average and we assert that the average has to be greater than zero, right? Because if you did have a transaction, because of this line, we cannot, we cannot, we don't count zeros um, in a transaction. So the assertion is true. Agreed? Okay, so it's telling us that the assertion is actually not true um, and gives some value. So it says that if count is one and sum is zero, then the average is zero which is correct, right? But then the question is, can this ever happen? Can count, can it ever, ever happen that count is one and sum is zero? Why? Exactly, so message value is an integer, right? With this require, we're saying message value is actually at least one here, and count only increases by one. So this property here, It's true, right? It's an invariant. It's true like at any point of the contract, right? But it's hard for the SMT checker to figure that out on its own. And that's what I meant with you as a developer of the contract, know this kind of thing, then you can help, you can help the SMT checker by adding those invariants whenever you have these harder checks. Let's see. OK, now it's fine. So I have one last example, um, which was the one that actually closed here. Um, yeah, it's the, same, it's the same contract, just with the extension that we have this external contract. And we call um, some function f in the external contract. And what's, what happens here is that when we call the external function, the knowledge um, gets basically erased. And you would need to add new constraints after the, after, the, um, after the function call, you would maybe even need to repeat um, constraints to, um, in order to help the solver to actually prove it and not get false positives. Yeah. And one last thing that I wanted to say is future plans that we have for, for the tool. Um, yeah, we have more examples, and I'd be glad to talk about um, the tool more offline if you guys want, want to talk about it. Um, as future plans, we have what I mentioned, which is um, this sort of function modular verification part, which is, is kind of involved with the state invariant automatic deduction, which is a very hard thing to do, but we want to try it anyway. Um, and also, one other thing we want to introduce rather um, soon is actually the ability to let the, um, let developers give this invariant. So something like you could you can write something like you declare your invariant and this would be one of them. And with this invariant, this invariant would be applied as a require in the beginning of every function and asserted in the end of every function. Um, in the end, we could even use that to get inductive proofs. Um, and yeah, just get, give more power to the SMT checker and actually get 
harder properties proven anyway, even though they're pretty hard. Um, so yeah, open for questions. Not sure how much time there's left. Yeah, no time left, so we can discuss offline. Um, time is gone. Thank you.